ready? Hey everyone, we're in southern Illinois. This is historically the French part of the state. I just passed uh, St. Louis, Missouri, a city named after a French king, Louis IX, also known as St. Louis. Today we're going to visit two river towns, Kaskaskia and Old Shawnee Town. The first one is located on the banks of the Mississippi River, and the second one is located by the Ohio River. Both had, at one point, their moment of historical significance, right? Kaskaskia was the capital of Upper Louisiana when the French were still here in North America. It later became the capital of the Illinois Territory and eventually the first state capital of the state of Illinois. Old Shawnee Town was at one point a major administrative center during the development of the Northwest Territory. Both communities welcomed Lafayette in 1825 but have since then turned into pretty much ghost towns. And I want to know what happened. Who is to blame for that change? Lafayette's visit in 1825 actually helps to answer these questions. It encapsulates the past and present pride of Southern Illinois, its French background, as well as the important role that the region played in the early fabric of Illinois statehood and in the westward expansion of the Union. So here we are all these years later, a lot has changed, a lot has been damaged by mother nature, but many memories have survived and we're here to tell you their stories. All right, we have arrived to Kaskaskia. Let's see what the town has to show us. If you're looking at what the counties looked like in the early history of Illinois statehood, you realize that they really start from the south and they head north, right? And the reason for that is because the southernmost part of what's now Illinois used to be French. For instance, Kaskaskia was created in 1703. It was originally a, a Jesuit settlement to Christianize Native Americans, at the same time conduct fur trade. And the French were here for you know, five, six decades. And they left North America in 1763 when they lost the French and Indian War. The British took over. They were here until the American Revolutions. The American Revolution took place. Americans moved in. What that meant was that by the late 1810s, early 1820s, there was still a need in Illinois to have a balanced ticket for the statewide elections. So when Illinois first becomes a state in 1818, the gentleman that runs for governor, his name was Bond, Shadrach Bond, had to pick a French Canadian to run alongside him as his lieutenant governor in order to appeal to the remnants of that French population. And that French Canadian is buried right here in Kaskaskia. <laughs> Pierre Menard, first lieutenant governor of Illinois. I think it's fabulous that we have his grave here in southern Illinois because I think it reminds people simply that might have forgotten that Illinois has a very strong French background, right? And to have the grave of a man that served at its, as its first lieutenant governor and he was French Canadian to me is extremely significant. So I think it's good that we have a material evidence here of the French background of Illinois. And we have to go deep in the southern part of the state to find it. In the earliest days, the rivers were the highways. 
So everybody built close to the river. And the Kaskaskia River was right out there. And it was a, a small river and then met up with the Mississippi seven miles down. So it made it a really thriving metropolis. One time the saying was, all roads lead to Kaskaskia. From his house, Menard could conveniently run the state affairs when Kaskaskia was the capital. It lasted only two years though. As more Americans settled up north, the influence of Kaskaskia gradually diminished. A new capital was needed, more centrally located, more American, and perhaps more importantly, less French. In 1820, Illinois' capital was moved to Vandalia. It moved again a third time in 1839 to Springfield, where it still is today. So in 1825, when Lafayette went to Kaskaskia, Menard played a very active role in the Frenchman's reception, but the community was long past its prime. The state moved on from Kaskaskia, but the town remained. Well, at least for a while. Following a major flood in 1881, the Mississippi River cut a channel into the Kaskaskia River. Over time, it permanently adopted and took over the course of the Kaskaskia River, widening the bed, deepening the water, and changing the confluence between the two rivers. The Mississippi was ruthless. On its way, it swallowed the remnants of human civilization. Kaskaskia was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The river, which the town had used for so long to prosper, ultimately became its downfall. Beaver Island, Kaskaskia yes. Island. Historically, they were part of a peninsula. Correct. Delineated in the north by the Kaskaskia River. Correct. And in the south by the Mississippi River. Yes. The two rivers were running parallel to each other, right? So what caused the change in 1881? So water always takes the path of least resistance. And you'll be able to see all throughout the river here, erosion. So if you get scour on a river bend and there happens to be a weak point here, well, I tell you, it takes a path of least resistance. It's gonna punch through that and then eventually connect itself and around. And that's more or less what happened with the historic town of Kaskaskia. So you're saying basically that that town was settled at an erosion point of the Mississippi River. Yes. That's very, very, Unlucky, yeah. to be honest. It is, but again, if you think about some of the historic Native American settlements uh, and, and also uh, European settlements, the river being the lifeline that it was, people wanted to be close, they wanted access, and unfortunately over time, things changed and it didn't work out. After the great shift of the Mississippi River in 1881, and gradually over time, people relocated the town of Kaskaskia to another location with available land. This is where I'm standing now, New Kaskaskia. And tracing Lafayette's footsteps, we really wanted to mark the stop that he made in Kaskaskia on April the 30th, 1825. Unfortunately, the old town now 
is under the Mississippi River, but we really thought that it was a great idea to reconnect Kaskaskia and through Lafayette's visit with its original French background by placing the sign near the church to refer to the Catholic origins of the French settlement here. And it was really a way for us to use Lafayette's identity as a Frenchman to reconnect it with the original identity of the Kaskaskia settlement. But this new Kaskaskia also suffered a similar fate at some point. The most famous episode was in 1993, which severely damaged the area. It is central to what this community became, but it's not unique to this town only. It's a phenomenon that one can witness across Southern Illinois in general. Today, Old Shawnee Town is pretty much a ghost town, but it, it wasn't always like that. It was once known as the Gateway to the West, a thriving city for people moving in. A federal land office had been established in 1812 to accommodate the new settlers that wanted to move to the West. A bank followed a few years later, created by a gentleman by the name of John Marshall in 1816. That bank, over time, grew outside of Marshall's home to get its own building by the late 1830s. In 1825, Lafayette came here. On May the 7th, 1825, he was entertained at a building known as Rawlings Hotel. This was once a booming city, the only one with Washington, D.C. chartered by the federal government. It has changed a lot. But the town, very much like what happened in Kaskaskia, suffered great damage from floods. The most famous instance of that took place in 1937. The bank actually flooded. You can still see the mark of how high the waters got. And it really forced the population to relocate. Most of them relocated to form a new community known as New Shawneetown. We are currently standing in the um, newest courthouse here in Shawneetown. It was built after the 1937 flood. It was built and finished in about 1940. 1937 flood was just devastating, and it, it didn't just happen here in Shawneetown. It happened all along the Ohio River. You know, you've got over 900 miles of that. I think it also brought the townspeople together to get through such a tragedy. So there's a mural that is located above the seat of the judge over there, very central to the room. What are the scenes represented on that mural and can you speak to the characters that we see uh, distributed throughout the painting? The mural itself is a depiction of Shawnee Town's history, the daily life that went on here. You can see the wagon uh, that the pioneers would have come across. Uh, a lot of them either came down the river or came in wagons, and they, that's kind of depicting the fact that this was the gateway to the west. Salt is in the center of it all. That was the industry around here. Lumber, furs, and then salt. I see slavery attached to that industry, that's also central. I see the Shawnee Native Americans to the top left, right? And I see in the background, the bank. Yes. The bank, the Greek Revival style bank that gave the settlers the credit that they needed to buy land and start businesses around here, right? And the choice was made in that mural that sits at the core of the courtroom, that's at the core of the courthouse. <laughs> to put Lafayette in there. 
Do you think it is indicative of how people felt about Lafayette? Is that an accident that he is in there? What does it say about what his visit meant for the community on May the 7th, 1825? I think the fact that Lafayette chose to stop here made them feel very important. Just the recognition uh, that he gave the town and the people, it made them important. It wasn't just someplace off somewhere. It was their town. Kaskaskia and Old Shawneetown cling on to Lafayette's visit with a visceral attachment because it informs so much of their identity. Since Lafayette's time, floods have wreaked havoc across southern Illinois. The region was decimated. The two towns no longer occupy the vital function that they were once assigned. They essentially became a living history museum. Despite the transformations that affected them, both towns remind us of one powerful thing. What makes us human is our ability to write our own history, celebrate it, and preserve it for the enjoyment and education of future generations. When the buildings are gone, sometimes the stories are all that's left, and it's up to us to make sure that they remain. The stories of Kaskaskia and Old Shawneetown will be told here forever, regardless of future floods. So in a way, what we're doing here is a form of historic preservation. That's it for us today. I want to thank you for following the Frenchman to the Prairie State. I will see you on the trail very soon. Thank you for watching. A bientôt.